Then he loved me and our dad was right near the fire too. And it's not because my friends 
were baptized before me, it's because like I'm accepting him into my life, not for like because my friends have gotten baptized, like for me, because this is my own walk, my own step. And I feel like he's real and I want him to come into my life and make it all better. When our house caught on fire, that's my that's the time I knew God, he was he's he was there to keep uh, to keep us safe, and and I and I knew that was the time I needed him most. And well, I want to do this because I'm ready to show the world that I love God and I know He's real. We're getting baptized. Christ Jesus our Lord, and according to your profession of faith in Him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptized in the likeness of His death, raised in the likeness of His birth. This is Katie Scruggs. In obedience to the divine command of Christ Jesus our Lord, and according to your profession of faith in Him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptized in likeness of His death, raised in the of His death. Start to a service, amen. It's so awesome to be able to see people follow the Lord in baptism, make a public declaration of their testimony. And you know, guys, when we come to church on Sunday, we are really just living out what the choir just sung, that there's a new name written out in glory. It's ours, and, and, and Christ is ours, and we declare that with our presence in this place today. So why don't you stand with us today? Let's sing a song about our identity in Christ. Here we go. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but He brought me in. Oh, His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free.
Amen. Good morning. It's so good to see you. All right, y'all can take a seat. Um, what a joy it is to worship um, this morning in this place. Um, I think about um, our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, which they've already worshipped today, but they're worshiping wherever they are. Um, and they're being the hands and the feet of Jesus where they are. And their desire is to serve and to procla- proclaim Jesus. And so I just, I just think what a blessing it is that we're, we're in this room and online um, worshiping. But I think of our, our brothers and sisters who um, don't have this uh, luxury that we have right now. Um, so what a blessing it is. But um, we want to con- continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine um, even uh, today. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, if, if you're new, if this is your first time either here in person or online, uh, we just want to say thanks for being here. We want to direct your attention um, to our website. There's a button on westhuntsville.com that says, um, I'm new, and you can go there, and um, we want to just get some information from you. We, want, we have a, a free gift for you. Or maybe you're here um, in the auditorium. There's a, a QR code there in front of me, in front of you. Um, you can just uh, hover your camera over that, and it'll send you to that website. We just want to say thank you uh, for being here. A few things going on coming up in early April, April 8th and 9th, is um, Man Camp. And that's going to be at Fort Bluff. And it's just a great weekend um, to refresh and reconnect with um, the Lord and with other brothers um, in the church. So that's coming up in, um, in April. And then another thing coming up is a membership seminar. Uh, maybe you're visiting and you're interested in learning more about West Huntsville. Um, you can meet um, with the pastors um, on Saturday, March 26. So that's a couple of weeks away um, is the membership seminar. And you can register for both of those events online. Uh, we want to be praying for um, our, our church body. We'll be praying for Ruth Myers in the passing of her father. We'll be praying for Darren Boyd in the passing of his brother. And we want to continue to pray for Kingsley Merkel um, just for strength in her recovery out of, after her liver transplant. And be praying for Danny Walford uh, for his lungs to improve as he's now at home. And uh, as I mentioned, we want to continue to pray for our uh, brothers and sisters in Ukraine um, for their protection and for opportunities to share their faith. So would you, uh, let's pray together. God, we just are so thankful for um, the ability to worship. What a joy to see um, new believers saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and uh, I want to tell the world that I uh, follow Jesus and uh, uh, just are here this morning uh, to be baptized. What a joy um, just to celebrate uh, with them. God, we pray um, right now for Ruth, God, and for Darren and the lost of loved ones. God, I pray that um, they can be still and know that you are uh, right there with them. Um, Lord, just comfort them. God, we pray for Kingsley. God, continue um, just to strengthen her. God, we um, just uh, lift her up in her recovery. We, we uh, lift up Danny Wofford as he's home, Lord. Continue to strengthen him in his uh, recovery. And God, we lift up our, our brothers and sisters, the believers in Ukraine. God, give them protection. And uh, God, just thank you for their heart to share their faith, to, to share Jesus in the midst of suffering. What a beautiful thing, God. So I just pray for them right now that you would just encourage them, that you would comfort them, that you would uplift them. I pray that uh, we here can know um, how to best minister to, uh, uh, to them through prayer and maybe just through um, giving, whatever we can, Lord. I pray that we can be mindful of that, Lord. Uh, thank you. Uh, that you are here with us. Make us aware of your presence this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A song about our Father in heaven and his love for us. So let's join in worship.
going to sing again.
Today's scripture passage is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their father in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. Thou was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they should all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Back on May the 9th, uh, 1981, uh, Sandra and I, we entered into a marriage covenant. And a symbol of that is, is the ring. That's my reminder. And Sandra had inscribed inside of this ring. It's very special. She says, dear Scott, you're the best thing ever. I, I am so grateful that the Lord gave me you and that as I pursued you, you said, yes, I'm the luckiest girl in the whole USA. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. Now, she sum, summarized and said, forever, Sandra and Scott, 5981. But it's a great reminder of entered into a binding covenant. Uh, in November of 2006, we signed our name over and over and over and over when we bought our house. This passing paper sign, pass paper sign. And the sellers, they had to make their agreement. They were selling the house, and the bank was happy because they're going to get all the money. But the best covenant I've ever been a part of is what took place in my life on April the 22nd, 1975. That's when the Lord proposed to me. He says, God, this is what I would like to do. I would like to come into your life to be the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life. And I simply said yes to him. Very similar to what it's like when you get married. You're responding to that proposal. And I said yes. And it was such a change for me because all of a sudden things on the inside were changing. The things that I used to do no longer appealed to me like they did. There was a new value, a new operating system on the inside. I didn't know all the terminology, but there was a change. And this was a binding agreement. God says, this is what I'm going to do for you when you respond to me. When you say yes to me, this is what I'm going to do for you. And I'm so grateful because what he did, nothing else needed to be done. What he did on that cross in that empty tomb, nothing else needed to be done. In fact, the Bible says he sat down because there's nothing else to do. It wasn't that he was exhausted. He had accomplished everything. So when you accomplish everything, you can sit down. You have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 8. Just, just glance at the first verse. We'll get into our passage in a moment. Since now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest, and who is our high priest? That's Jesus. Who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty and the heavens. So Jesus is our high priest, and we go to chapter 10 of Hebrews. Just kind of glance a couple of chapters over and look at verse number 12. But this man, referring to Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set down at the right hand of God. 
So we're learning something here because as we understand Jewish history, uh, a Jewish priest, when he was offering sacrifices that they would have to do, he would continually stand because the work was never done. Because they would have to come day after day and for the sin of the nation of Israel once a year for that atonement. So it was a continual thing. They could never sit down. But I want you to notice what Jesus did in this covenant that he has given to us. It's a once and for all deal. It's only happening one time. His life, his sacrifice, and what he did, he sat down. In chapter 10, just go up a couple verses from chapter or chapter 10, verse number 10, it says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And, and that's the beauty when we think about this, this new covenant. What you heard read out of Jeremiah 31 is a direct quotation in Hebrews chapter 8. The writer of this book is quoting out of Jeremiah 31. He's saying, now this is this new covenant I, I want you to, to know about. So it's a direct quote out of Jeremiah 31, and he's saying this is the new covenant with the house of Israel. Now, covenant is an agreement between two people. You're saying this is what I'm going to do. And in the time of Moses, there's a lot of different covenants. And during Moses' time, we call that the Mosaic covenant. The covenant was simply this. Now, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what you have to do. That was the Mosaic covenant. What was given to Moses, he came down and told the people of Israel, he says, now this is what God's going to do, and this is what you've got to do. And so the people said, okay, we'll do it. We'll keep the law. Uh, in chapter 8 here of Hebrews, verse 8, uh, the commentary is this, God found fault with the people. He found fault with the folks because there's nothing wrong with the law, but there was something wrong with the people, their inability to keep it, even though they said we're going to do it. Now, when we come to the new covenant, it's about the same law. Law hasn't changed. But God is doing something different with the new covenant. He is putting this, and if you look at verse number 10, he, he is putting this on, the, on their minds, and he's going to write them on their hearts. Beautiful imagery here, because you know the Ten Commandments, God's finger wrote that on a stone. It was written on a tablet, a stone tablet. But here he's saying that this new covenant is going to be written in their minds, and he's going to write it on their hearts. There's a major difference between these two covenants. The old covenant was conditional. Real important word, conditional. The obligation was on the people. All right, I'll keep my side of this agreement if you keep yours. So that was the, that was the old covenant the one that Moses gave. The Old Covenant was based upon people remembering the Ten Commandments. Now notice, Ten Commandments starts off, you shall have no other gods before me. Notice the word you. We could go through and say, uh, you should not make any idols. Again, you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. It's you, you, you. Do you feel the pressure, the obligation? This is what you've got to do. And the folks, when they were given this option, they said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll keep it. We'll keep up our side of the bargain here. Here's the new covenant. Notice the key word was unconditional. The obligation is on God. Can you feel what the magnitude of this covenant, how beautiful it is. Now, I'm going to read verse 10 through verse 12. You can follow along, but I want you to notice, I want you to see it. 
for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sin and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And all God's people said, you see the magnitude, the beauty, how much this is so much better than the old, this new covenant. So let's look at it. One major thought today, this new covenant is about a new righteousness. Amazing what God is doing for us. Again, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Uh, this new covenant is going to involve the law of God, and it's going to be internal. Huge difference. Not external, but internal. You see, the law doesn't change. It can't change. You say, why is that? Because the law is the revelation of God's character. That's who He is. When you read the law, you're, you're seeing just just who he is. When he says in his word, you shall not steal, what that's simply saying is, God doesn't steal. It's an expression of his character. When you see this command, you shall not commit adultery, it's because God is totally faithful. It's an expression of his character. So Jesus is saying, this law is not going to pass away, not one dot or one little cross in the T is going to disappear from this law. The law is good. We just have a problem of keeping it. But Jesus is saying, now this new commandment is not going to be written on tables of stone. It's going to be written on your heart. So what does the law do for us? Real important. We've got a great commentary coming out of Galatians about what does the law do for us? Well, Chapter 3, verse 10 of Galatians. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Because it is written, everyone who does not do everything written in the book of the law is cursed. Now, that's some really good news, isn't it? Not at all. It is saying the law is, is perfect, it's good, but we haven't we haven't done all that the law has required, and, and we've messed up once. If we don't do everything, if we mess, mess up once, it's as though we've broken the law. It's though we're, we're undone. The, the Bible speaks about anything that is not of faith is of sin. So you may be thinking, you know what? My, my scorecard is pretty good. I haven't done the top five that's on my scorecard. And so I think God's going to grade me pretty well. Well, the Bible's saying if if you've messed up once, if there's a time in your life that you didn't love the Lord with all of your heart, if you did anything that was not of faith, the Bible says that's sin. If you did anything like that, it's though you're guilty of breaking the law. You're under a curse. Do we feel the magnitude of, of that separation from God? He's holy. His character. A few verses down in Galatians, this is where we start to get hope. Christ redeemed us. That means he paid the price. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So what we're realizing, that the law came from God, and it was highly regarded for generations. Folks, uh, you look at the nation of Israel, they gave a lot of respect to the law. But what do we find about the law? What does it do for us? It puts us in prison. It says you're condemned because you, if you've messed up once, it's though you've broken it altogether. You're in a place, you're in a position of condemnation because God is holy, His character is holy, His nature is holy, and we have messed up. We are, we are in a desperate mess. That's why the Bible says this, for all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. Now, don't stitter at your neighbor, but that verse is written to your neighbor that you're sitting next to. And before you get too pompous in this, in verse 10 of Romans 3, it says, there's none righteous. No, not one. So here we are. We're under condemnation. We're in a mess. And so here we have this issue. If we go to the, to the old, it's saying the old is external. It really can't do a lot for us. It can't, and I like this thought, it can demand what was right, but can never accomplish it. It, it can show us what is right. I mean, it can bring things for our behavior. Oh, I better straighten up here. You know, I can't break the law because, boy, I, I'm aware of God's presence. Or for us, we think about a simple illustration of driving down the parkway, and all of a sudden our speedometer is a little bit maybe more than 50 miles an hour. We're just kind of going with the flow. And then we see one of Huntsville's finest cars. They're on the side. And all of a sudden, what do we do? We might be going 50, but we're going to put our foot on the brake because we don't want to make sure. We want to make sure that we're not breaking the law. It helps us to conform. You know, I always thought, you know, we used to have motorcycle police, and I always thought it'd be kind of neat to get on the parkway, like borrow somebody's Harley in here, and I get my hair dryer out with a helmet on as folks come by, just put up my <laughs> hair dryer. <laughs> Look at all the brake lights. We can conform because, you know, when we have pressure, but the law doesn't help us in the sense that of living by faith. That's what God is wanting from us. The law, it puts all the pressure on us as though we're going to try to accomplish that we're going to score really big. I've been really good uh, this week, so God must really like me. And, and we get into what is called legalism. We're adding to. We're saying it's based on what I do, and that's the problem with the law. Look how good I am I, I'm not as bad as other folks, so I'm looking really good. And a lot of people have the mentality that they're going to have a good shot of heaven because of their scorecard. I want to tell you, if you've messed up once, you're under condemnation. So this law, this external, doesn't help us with the life of faith. But the new is internal. Total change here. The new covenant is on the inside. God is doing something on the inside. It's not tables of stone external, but it's written on our hearts. Ezekiel says something about this new covenant. In fact, he's talking about the new covenant just like Jeremiah. This is, this is what he said. Ezekiel 36, I will put my spirit in you. Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come maybe upon a prophet or some person for a temporary time, but now this new covenant is that the Holy Spirit is going to be in each person. Uh, Jesus explained this to his disciples there in the upper room. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, and, and he simply says this in John 14. He says, now, he's going to live with you, and he will be in you. He says, this is why I've, I must go, because some Something good is going to come for you. The Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell in you. Were the disciples not different after Pentecost? Their life was radical. I, I mean, you, you look at their life, you go, are these the same guys? I mean, they were struggling over who the greatest is and all of that, and, and now they're serving, they're giving their lives for the cause of Christ. Their, their life has been transformed. It's because of of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, and it's true for us. This is so true for us. I, I love this statement. Chew on this one. The new covenant doesn't revise the law. It simply relocates the law. Chew on that. Because there's nothing wrong with the law. I, I mean, the law is no longer in the Ark of the Covenant, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, they're in Jerusalem. Indiana Jones may still be looking for it, but he is saying it's, it's changed. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit 
enables us to apply the new covenant to what was a command has been, from the Old Testament, has been changed to promises in the new covenant. Chew on that. What was in the old covenant, commands in the new have turned to promises. I read a story about a man who was in prison. And he was in prison because he broke the law. He was caught stealing. And while he was in prison, he heard the good news of the gospel of Christ. And he responded and he received the Lord Jesus as his Savior, the forgiver of his sins, the leader of his life. Well, he got out of prison, and because of the change of his life, he said, you know what, I, I want to go to church. He had never been to church. He said, I, I want to go to church. And so he got out not knowing anything about church or churches. He just went to the first one. It was a random choice, and he walked in, sat down, and he looked up in the front of the church, and there in the front of the church was the Ten Commandments. And he's going, oh, no. Because the Ten Commandments, as he read those, it reminded him of his history. It reminded him of his background, of his failure, of his weakness. And as he read that, he, he just felt condemned. But then he, he read the commandments again. He says, that, and this time he discovered something totally different from what he did the first time. When he saw that commandment, you shall not steal. Well, the first time he read it, it was a command. But this time, he read it, you shall not steal. It was a promise. What before was commands of condemnation had turned to promises. You shall not steal. You're not going to be caught in a idolatry. You're, you're not going to take my name in vain. They turn into promises. Why? Because the law was written on the inside. His operating system had changed. Now he had a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that he never had before. It's what the Lord said in Philippians chapter 2 through the apostle Paul. It says God is working in us for his will to do what is his good pleasure. Working in us to do, to accomplish what he desires. So now he is seeing that the Lord has turned all these commands and the promises that he is the substitute, he is the sin offering, he's changed everything. His life has changed because now he's abiding in Christ and there is fruit associated with righteousness. The motivation that he has is coming from the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 speaks about this. One of the greatest chapters on what does it mean to walk in the Spirit is Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned the sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us. Notice that phrase. What the law required in ourselves, we could not do, but through Christ, it would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to his spirit. So as we have received the Lord, as we are abiding, we got a new operating system on the inside. We are saying, Lord, we want to abide in you. You are the vine. We are the branches. The natural response of that is going to be fruit. Philippians 1, verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Fruit is a consequence of life. As you abide in Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to produce His life through us. The fruit of righteousness is going to flow through us. So God is working in us. He is flowing through us. And so we come to the point of saying, the blessings, what, the blessings we receive from the new covenant. We understand there's a lot more to this teaching of the new covenant. We know there's promises to the nation of Israel that the church doesn't replace. 
The nation of Israel has the promise of the land that God says, this is what I'm going to do for you. The promise of the seed coming through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, coming through Judah, through David. Other covenants associated with those names there. What blessings do we get? Because we're grafted in. We're not Israel. We're the church. But what are the blessings? We get those blessings. We get the forgiveness of sins. And that is tremendous news. Because we're all condemned. We're all guilty. But God says, no, under this new covenant, I'm not even going to bring those things up again. And what's the other blessing that we get? The indwelling of the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the blessing that we receive. Now, when, when you read this passage that comes out of Ephesians, you're, you're going to have a, a different outlook. So then, remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised, by those called the circumcised, talking about the Jewish people and the Gentile people, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, the new covenant. The ramifications of this, when we, here just in a, a few moments, as we partake of what we call communion, we're celebrating the fact that we are spiritual beneficiaries of what Jesus has done. The covenant, another word for the covenant is the last will and testament. Testament is another word for covenant. For a will to be in effect, someone has to die. So this is what we're learning. God, through the person of Jesus Christ, saw our condition and was moved with compassion, took on humanity. He lived in perfection of all that was required by the, by the law of God. He was perfect righteousness, sinless. He could qualify to be a sacrifice, a substitute. So when we partake, we are saying because of our relationship, because we have responded to the gift of God, we know it's not by our works, but it's by faith, receiving his gift. The moment that we said yes to him, we entered into a new relationship. We are moved out of condemnation into acceptance in the beloved. And this is guaranteed because God says, I'm backing up this part of the covenant as we would go deeper to understand, going back into Genesis, seeing the covenant that he made with Abraham. This is what God did, and we are simply able to respond to say yes. That's the requirement. Our repentance, our belief to say, Lord, I'm turning from myself, from my old ways, from my scorecard, and Lord, I'm trusting you completely. My faith, I'm activating faith. That's the only thing God is pleased with, is your faith. The moment that you move from a self-centeredness, saying, Lord, I can do this myself, to a God-centeredness, say, Lord, it's all on you. It's what you've done, not what I have done. See, that's the issue that a lot of folks with religion have. It's what I do, and it's not what I do. It's what he has done. That's the only thing that makes us acceptable. Now, you're going to read this scripture, hopefully different than you've ever read it before, which brings us to what Jesus was instituting there with his disciples that he wanted us to carry on, which we are to this day. Luke chapter 22, and he took bread, and, and that was a symbol of his sinless humanity, his perfect righteousness. It was unleavened bread, no sin. That was the symbolic purpose of unleavened bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, 
he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood, which is poured out for you, the lights came on. The new covenant. Oh, Ezekiel spoke about that. Jeremiah spoke about that. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to pay the price for this new covenant to become a reality. So when you partake, you are saying, Lord, I remember what you have done for me. It's not me, it's you. And Lord, as I take this bread, which reminds me of of your body, the sinlessness of your life, how you fulfilled the law completely. And as you said, it is finished, Lord. You did everything required by God the Father. And Lord, I remember the sinlessness of your life. And Lord, as I take this cup, the fruit of the vine, I remember that your blood was shed to, for the remission of my sins. Lord, for me to, to come in is by your blood, the blood applied. Lord, I am so grateful that you took my sin, the cruelty, the brutality that you put upon yourself so I can know forgiveness, that I can know you personally. That is what's taking place when you partake of what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. Let me give you one other thought. Not only did Jesus, our high priest, offer the sacrifice, he was the sacrifice. And if you're here this morning and you have religion, but you've never, and you've got your, your scorecard, and you're thinking, this is what I've done. I've been a pretty good person. I want you to see, if you've messed up once where you didn't apply faith to something in your life, just one misstep, it's though you've broken everything. But God in his love says, listen, this is what I'm going to do. He who knew no sin became sin for you, that you might be made in the righteousness of God. Christ. Everything that Christ accomplished is now for the believer, for the one who's called upon him to be their savior, to be their sin bearer, to be their leader. The righteousness of Christ is put on your account. So when God sees you, he sees you in Christ. Totally forgiven. Totally accepted. This is the good news and this is what we are remembering. If you're here this morning and you've got a scorecard and the Holy Spirit is convincing you, He is convicting you, it's not your scorecard. It's what Christ did on that cross. I would encourage you this very moment to exchange your sin by faith for His righteousness. We got married on May the 9th, 1981, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a huge difference between 1 o'clock that Saturday afternoon and 3 o'clock that Saturday afternoon is what we said at 2 o'clock. There's a big difference in your life as well. Before you came to know Christ, when you came to know Christ, and since you've come to know Christ. Radical change. You have the forgiveness of sin. You have the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. These are spiritual benefits, <laughs> blessings that we receive because we're grafted in. We get the blessings. They're falling on us as believers, being in Christ. Would you call upon Jesus? Would you ask him this very moment? Put your faith in what he's done, not what you've done.
what He has done. Trust Him. And what you do this very hour, God will receive all those who call upon His name. He will, re- he will hear the cry of your heart. If you are a believer, this ought to be a reminder of the blessings of what God has given to you, the relationship. And it ought to motivate us, not from external conformity, behavior modification, to say, you got to do this. No, because I want to, because of my love for Jesus. See, where's that coming from? It's coming from the person of the Holy Spirit. He's working in you to will and to do of his own good pleasure. It's his desire in your heart. So walk with him. Walk in the Spirit. I'm going to ask our deacons, they would, to make preparations to allow us to partake of what we know as these spiritual blessings. The forgiveness of sin through Christ, the benefit of this new covenant. The person of the Holy Spirit, the benefit of this new covenant. We are remembering what we've done as we called upon the name of the Lord to save us. So I want to encourage you as we get ready to pass these elements out for, for you to reflect upon the goodness of God. And if you have children here and you're saying, should they partake? Only if they have a remembrance of knowing that Jesus as their Savior and the leader of their life. That's how you would make that decision. If they understand that, that's great. That's wonderful. But I want you to be encouraged today as, as we have this opportunity to say, Lord, I am so grateful for these blessings. Take the bread of life Broken for all my sin Your body crucified To make me whole again I will recall the cup Poured out sacrifice to trade this sinner's end for your new
following the pattern that the Lord gave. So this has gone on for just about 2,000 years. And the Lord said, I'm not going to do this until I, I'm with you. Uh, how that gives us encouragement to know that he's coming again because he loves us. First Corinthians, this is the New Testament church. and He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Lord, we're grateful for that body that went through extreme suffering because you loved us. And Lord, that love has not changed today, so Lord, we just want to express to you, thank you for going to that cross. In your name we pray, amen. The same way, he, same manner, he said, this, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for the blood. Thank you for the remission of all sin. Thank you that you're not going to bring up one sin to our condemnation because they're all under your blood. And so, Lord, we magnify you, Lord, for the sinlessness and the purity of your life and of your blood. Thank you that the blood has been applied. We praise you for your name's sake. Put those in the cup holders. Thank you so much for joining our service today. We hope this was an encouragement to you. If you have any questions or would like to talk to someone, we'd love for you to contact us by emailing whbc at westhuntsville.com. To learn more about WHBC and all that God is doing here, we encourage you to visit us online at westhuntsville.com.